has 256 electrodes. That's really because the people who have been working on this have been primarily neuroscientists and MPs and not electrical engineers, not tech people. But that's starting to change. So now the University of Michigan has a 1,000 electrode wireless chip that's about to come out of market, and a German company called Infineon has a 16,000 electrode chip that's about to come out of market. And of course, current microprocessors, the, the chip in this old, slow netbook has about half a billion uh, transistors in it in an area not much bigger. Now they do run hot, but we don't have to run these brain systems at gigahertz. We run it at 100 cycles a second, 100 hertz, and that's keeping up with the brain. So there's a lot of headroom for increasing just the sheer bandwidth of I.O. and out of the brain. And that will improve the resolution and accuracy of all of this. And indeed, uh, the visual systems on in human trials right now are kind of in this zone here. And you can see even with just 72 by 72, which is a long way short of what we could do, with about 5,000 pixels, that's getting to the point that you, know, you can tell it's a young woman and not an old woman, for instance. So we will get there bit by bit. Now, the other really big limitation in the hardware is this is your brain we're talking about. So very, very few of us would uh, voluntarily go in for brain surgery, or the payoff would have to be extremely, extremely high for that. Now, if you're blind, or you're deaf, or you're paralyzed from the neck down, the payoff uh, can be small for a normal person, but huge for you. And that's why they're going to be the early adopters of this technology. Um, that said, you know, some would look at this and say, brain surgery is so unsafe, so risky, so complicated, that this will absolutely never take off as an elective procedure for someone who's utterly healthy. Of course, you could have said that about eye surgery a while ago. We take our eyes very seriously, not quite as much as our brains, but none of us wants to lose an eye. And for quite a while, there was essentially no such thing as elective eye surgery. Uh, but that changed due to a technology, an invention called the XMR laser that made LASIK possible. And what happened was a you know, two order of magnitude change in the frequency of eye surgery from less than 20,000 up to today, it's actually more than 2 million eye surgeries done in the US per year, which are basically all LASIK. Uh, and the cost has gone from actually tens of thousands of dollars per eye down to a few hundred dollars per eye depending on whether or not you go to the lowest bidder. Uh, you might chop around a little bit and go for the second lowest. Um, but seriously, actually it's cheaper now, and even the lowest bidder now is not only cheaper, they're actually it's much safer, much more likely to get the good outcome, and much less likely to have a bad outcome than it was just 10 years ago. So is there a LASIK for brain surgery? Is there that sort of transformation of brain surgery possible? In the book, I kind of I invent a whole new thing, which is you swallow this drug, it's a liquid, and the little nanoparticles cross into your brain and just take care of it, which is very nice, it's very convenient. Uh, I think we're actually pretty far away from that. Uh, but there is something that maybe it's not quite as big as LASIK, but that is certainly making brain surgery a lot easier. And it's uh, called neurovascular stereotactic surgery. And so there's two parts of it. Neurovascular means brain, blood. And it means going into the brain, not the skull, but via the blood. And this is happening quite frequently the last several years for aneurysm surgery, where it used to be that you would spend 12 hours in surgery, have your skull opened, and spend at least a week and maybe two weeks in the hospital recovering from an aneurysm repair. Now the surgery is a little over an hour, and it'll keep you around for an hour or two of observation, sorry, for a day or two of observation after that. And it costs about a tenth as much as it did. What they do is they stick a probe in through your bloodstream, usually through uh, your, the artery in your thighs, more artery, and then work its way up to the brain and make the changes there. And they get it up there via the stereotactic part, which means using magnets. So what happens in an OR that looks like this, probably a little bit less space age than this. There's probably some doctors there, for one thing, um, and it's probably not quite, quite so good. But you are placed in this area. The doctors who are doing the surgery actually aren't looking at you, they're looking at a computer screen that shows them the, where the probe is in your body and a uh, view of the probe. It has a joystick where they can steer the probe as it moves through your body. And then this machine is using magnetic fields that steer it remotely through the various parts of your body until it reaches the destination. Now, looking at this, one of the kind of elder statesmen of neuroscience 
a guy by the name of Rodolfo Linus, who's the editor of the journal Neuron, has proposed a way that we could use this to get a lot of data I.O. in your brain. What he points out is that nanotubes make excellent wires, um, and these aren't even single tubes, they're just nano wires. They're actually many widths of a tube across, but they're tiny. This is 200 nanometers, that's half the width of the wavelength of light. And these are probably you know, less than 100 nanometers across. A bundle of a million of these wires, which is what Linus proposes we would use, has a cross-sectional area about 1% the size of the smallest uh, capillary in your body. So his idea is, hey, let's put in a bundle of a million of these, work it in through your bloodstream, and we'll get it to the brain and we'll use magnets to branch it out, and we'll touch a million neurons, and we start listening to all of those together, and learn all kinds of new things about the brain. So uh, this is not being done in humans today, needless to say, but the research in animals has started on whether or not we can do this. So there are things on the horizon that look like they could increase the safety of working in the brain and the amount of data we can get in and out tremendously. So both of those things I just talked about are hardware limitations. We'll get better at both of them. Maybe not uh, drop dead easy, they'll get better. But what about the software? Do you guys work on software? I've worked on software. Well, one thing that we all know is that software is perfect. It's completely reliable. I have no idea what this blue thing is. It's a screensaver or something, right? Uh, so what happens if you have a system in your brain and the software crashes? What does that mean? What will that do to you? Or what if and you're at a security company? What if uh, there's malware out there? Viruses that you can get. Um, this is one of the scarier things about wiring yourself into uh, the electronic world directly into your brain. And in fact, there is some movement of hacking in this direction. Do you guys know who this is? Right. This guy named Barnaby Jacks. And what he is most famous for is he's a, a hacker, he's an architect in the cafe. I think he was, he might have just moved. Uh, he's most famous for this hack that he did at the Black Hat conference where he uh, remotely caused this ATM to start spewing bills over the stage. Very dramatic. I think it was monopoly money, unfortunately. Um, but lately, Barnaby has been working on hacking medical devices. Now, the FDA regulates medical devices, makes sure that they're safe, but they don't test the software. There are no threat models for medical devices, and Barnaby has shown why this might be a problem. Uh, so here, what he's at his hands is a, a, a radio system that he's built himself, and what it does is it can discover and interface with insulin pumps within a several block radius of itself. If you turn it on, he can discover the unique IDs of all the insulin pumps within a few blocks, and he can then route them. And once having done that, he can make them do anything, including, for instance, dumping all 300 units of insulin that they carry, which in a diabetic would be instantly fatal. That's what he did in 2011. 2012, he came back with a new hack. Oh, this is the Medtronic insulin pump that he's hacked, by the way, which is the most uh, common insulin pump on the market. In 2012, he took the most common pacemaker model on the market and demonstrated that with a much smaller range, about 50 feet, he could cause it to discharge a 730 volt shock to the person wearing it, which would also be instantly fatal to that person. Now, how many of you watch a show called Homeland? Okay, if you don't want a spoiler, I'll plug your ears, okay? So I gather that in the, the recent season of Homeland, one of the plot lines is someone assassinates the vice president by remotely turning off his pacemaker. And that's not actually that far off from reality. Um, and if some of you might remember that uh, Dick Cheney for a while, when he was vice president, had no pulse. He was in heart failure, uh, and he had a rotary pump that just pumped his blood. I don't know what the APIs were on that system, but somebody should look into it. Okay, you can. Uh, <laughs> so uh, security is uh, that's my second biggest uh, concern, and you, if you read the book, you will find some security exploits that happen inside of it that are hopefully fun and interesting and scary. Uh, but the really the biggest question for me is what's the effect of this sort of technology on society? So throughout history. Every new information technology has had big impacts on society. So the printing press had two really big impacts. Okay? One is it supercharged innovation. It didn't start the Renaissance exactly, but it supercharged it, and the scientific revolution 
and the Enlightenment by allowing ideas and inventions to spread more easily, run into each other, recombine, and so on. It was also remarkably um, anti-authoritarian. So the first thing printed on the printing press was the famous Gutenberg Bible. But not long after that, Martin Luther printed his list of complaints for the Catholic Church on this, mass printed them, and then mailed them to the doors of church as he was tweeting. He blogged and tweeted. Um, and that created the Protestant Church and tore down a lot of the power of the Catholic Church. Okay? So information technology in that case was a liberalizing society. But it wasn't always so. Uh, earlier in history, the Sumerians and Egyptians had writing. And their writing was not a source of liberalization. It actually expanded the power of empire. It allowed these vast empires to grow and have very top-down effects on society. And that was really because only a very, very small fraction of society had access to or control over the technology. So that matters. Who has access, who has control over the technology or, uh, directions? Uh, and we have that conflict today with Infotech. Uh, this is a, a a uh, picture that went around during the Arab Spring. I love this picture, right? Revolution Tools, AK-47, X, Machete, X. Twitter, check. Facebook, check. And it's true. If you uh, followed the Arab Spring, in Egypt, what happened there, a guy named Wael Monin was the Google exec who was arrested, uh, disappeared for a while during that. He was one of the guys who helped start it. What happened there is a kid in Alexandria was busted by the cops for having pot, and they beat him up, and it was caught on video. And that video was posted to YouTube, and then got a lot of hits. And the first protests in Egypt were organized. They were a Facebook event. It was a protest over the event seen in that video. And that is part of what helped trigger a lot of what happened there. On the other hand, there was a kind of a failed revolution in Iran not that far long ago. And we found out there that the authorities were using Twitter to track down people who were tweeting incendiary or anti-authoritarian things. So it can go both ways, for sure. Um, there is the optimistic view, there is the possibility, and I think in general throughout history, the reality that infotech has been liberalizing, and this would be the most kind of intimate infotech we could have, but there's also the possibility of it being used to create sort of a big brother for society. So that's one of the topics that I try to tackle in the novel, and it's I think the most important. Um, I'm an optimist, I think that more infotech and the ability to communicate our thoughts directly will be something that is a huge win for society, but we always have to stay on guard for the negative uses as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. Um, I can take some questions now. I don't have any of the books, but if you want, there's bookmarks here uh, with the book on. So thanks. So um, when you talked about the connections, right? So the connection of the one rat to the other rat. Uh, the other rat was able to uh, traverse the maze based on memories, but in a way it was connecting their consciousness, right? So the, that rat one is a, a study ongoing. We haven't seen any output from that yet. But the monkeys, they definitely could communicate what those sounds were going from one way to another. So that, so I don't know if I have the right vocabulary for it. I bet you do. Like the idea that I'm self-aware and conscious separately from you. Right, so I'm an individual and I'm aware of it. Like, do these once they're connected, do they become like jointly self-aware? Like, identifies them, you know, as a single organism instead of, instead of two consciousness. I think as a practical matter, the bandwidth is too low to really have to worry about that. Um, but there is kind of human empathy, right? Like, when you know someone really well, you actually, if they're in pain, we find that your pain centers, if you're empathic, someone actually light up when you think that they're in pain. So we already have kind of a little bit of, of meta-human suborganism stuff happening. But I think that's, that's the right question to ask, and that is kind of a direction of if we have a million electrodes going from one way to another, what happens then? What if we have a billion? And then you, we really might see some things that are blurring of the boundaries between individuals. Uh, back there, I want to move it in. Something that's related to that, that um, it's related to what you mentioned about uh, the epilepsy. It's another treatment important. If one, one treatment is local ablation, uh, but if that doesn't work, if it's cross brain, another treatment is what's called split brain surgery, where you sever uh, the major corpus callosum, which, which uh, connects the two sides of the brain, and 